Center uh, for Language Studies and Department of English and Humanities at ULAB. Welcome to the second day of the three-day international conference, Entangled Englishes in Translocal Spaces. The second day begins with the second plenary session of a conference titled Translingual English, Creating New Languages and Performing New Identities. Our plenary speaker is Dr. Sandra Dovchi, who is a senior research fellow at the School of Education, Carton University, Australia. She is a Discovery Early Career Research Fellow awarded by an Australian Research Council. Before that, she worked as an associate professor at the University of Aizu, Japan. She has authored numerous articles in international peer-reviewed journals. Her single authored monograph, Language, Media and Globalization in the Periphery was published in 2018 by Rutledge and Language, Social Media and Ideologies was published by Springer in 2020. Her co-authored research monograph with Alistair Pennycook and Shala Sultana titled Popular Culture, Voice and Linguistic Diversity, Young Adults on and Offline was published in 2017 by Palgrave Macmillan. I would now request Dr. Sandra Dovchi to start the plenary session, please. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much for conference organizers for inviting me to your conference. I feel very privileged and honored to be here today. Um, so uh, today I will, in line with the uh, conference topic, today I will talk about translingual English in terms of how it actually creates new, new forms of languages and how it performs new identities. So um, I would like to, uh, so we, first we start with the question, uh, what do we mean by translingual English? So in order to define this concept, uh, um, I will have to uh, revisit uh, some of the uh, traditional frameworks such as bilingualism, multilingualism, code switching, code mixing and so forth. So um, as we all know, all these traditional frameworks are very useful frameworks. They have established this solid sort of scholarship in terms of how we understand current linguistic diversity. Um, but um, but we, when we talk about um, traditional frameworks such as bi-multilingualism, we will have to talk about uh, language in terms, in terms of sort of, um, in, uh, in terms of separate categories. So if the speaker speaks, for example, his first language is Mongolian and the second language is Japanese and the third language is English, when they, for example, code switch, they would have to um, code switch separately. So we need to understand, um, for example, bilingualism uh, through persons who command two or more languages, use one and other additional language, and they use e each of their languages in a way that does not in principle differ from the way in which monolinguals use that same language. So any language is sp spoken purely, um, any language is spoken fluently, um, so they should not be mixed with another language. So we need to understand bimultilingualism. Through the, pros, uh, through the perspective of sort of understanding monolingualism as well. So this main trend in uh, bimultilingual studies uh, recently in applied linguistics have started receiving lots of criticisms uh, because they are trying to count uh, the number of languages and they're trying to sort of categorize languages through separate linguistic codes. So here's, um, yeah, here's the study of um, Jorgensen and his team, um, and they're talking about the, the norms of biomultilingualism here and uh, double or multiple monolingual norms here, which I have just explained. So, so for example, persons who command two or more language, languages uh, will employ their full linguistic competence at any given time, adjusted to the needs and possibilities of the conversation including the linguistic skills of the interlocutors. So, um, so here's another definition of code switching as well. Uh, speakers of more than one languages are known for their ab ability to code switch or mix their languages during the communication, but we need to understand these code switching through separate codes, separate linguistic categories. 
But then I explained that in recent applied linguistics, especially in recent critical applied linguistics. Um, so uh, what do we mean by post by multilingualism is um, the recent studies which have emerged in the critical applied linguistics, they are criticizing that, you know, traditional frameworks should not be really uh, counting the languages or categorizing the languages because humans actually, they display the signs that um, they are not actually competent or at least competent only to a limited degree in the various languages they borrow, switch or mix. So speakers are actually using the available linguistic resources um, and these available linguistic resources, they can come from technology, media, available capital and resources, education, ideologies, and so forth. So communication patterns appear to have become and continue to become more and more dynamic and more and more integrated and more and more mobile and complex in this highly globalized world. So it's very hard actually to uh, categorize, you know, um, all these languages separately because humans, you know, we as humans, we are not necessarily competent in or fluent or we can or, or purely speaking those separate languages. So that's the main argument of the uh, by, uh, post by uh, multilingualism. So here also another arguments from post by multilingualism as people from a greater range of territories, they come into contact, so do they communicate a repertoire. So uh, repertoires uh, are, you know, not necessarily fixed because they are mobile and they change in use. So uh, language users also um, may employ whatever linguistic and communicative fe features, uh, repertoires available to them, and then they can achieve their communicative aims regardless of, uh, you know, how well they know those languages. So this is why we need to really um, understand language more critically, especially in this highly globalized world, which is uh, connected through media and technology and other capitals and resources. So uh, in line with the post by multilingualism, we have um, trans perspectives emerging in critical applied linguistics. We have lots of new terms coined by scholars, for example, as you can see, translanguaging, transidioma, translingualism, multilanguaging, translocalism, even transgrammaring and transcripting are coming out lately. And um, of course, uh, we have some classic terms such as metrolingualism and polylanguaging and so forth. So all of these uh, new terms, they, are, they have one main ethos. It's basically to understand language in terms of its integrated stylistic purpose and in terms of its integrated um, uh, repertoires. So, when we talk about translingual English, translingual English is basically um, defined, um, translingual English is basically based on these critical trans perspectives, right? So, um, so what do we mean by translingual English is the main idea is um, English can be also translingual language. You know, we don't have to, for example, separate English in terms of uh, in terms of his purpose, in terms of uh, in terms of his ideas, in terms of what is involved in English, English can be a trans uh, translingual language which is situated in translocal space, and Eng English can be flu you know English can be the mixture of the fluidity and fixity that moves across, while it can also become embedded in the materiality of local and social re relations. So English can be also a um, um, language that is uh, uh, moved beyond uh, its linguistic and cultural boundaries and then change and then reused to sort of uh, uh, create new sort of meanings, new ideas and so forth. So translingual English is about um, Translingual English is about um, 
yes, communi communicative codes and resources and modes being borrowed, being banded and blended, and then becoming into, into a new modes of expressions. So we have lots of studies in translingual English. I've just, um, I've just presented some of the main uh, books, including mine, uh, uh, sorry. Um, so uh, translingual English is, um, according to translingual Eng English conceptualization, communication starts not from the code, but uh, communication starts from the speaker. So we need to look at the speakers and um, language users, English users where they come from, what is their social linguistic background and so forth. And the complexity of translingual English is in use and action with the dynamics of identity construction, performance and negotiation, and then communicative resources and repertoires and modes and styles and speech and genres embedded within translingual English may constitute another new linguistic and identity repertoires, which can afford adaptations to the contingency of social life. Okay, so I try to sort of briefly um, uh, define what is translingual English. Now, I would like to uh, move on and because we have so many studies in translingual English uh, lately, we are also, and the, the studies around translingual English is also expanding a lot, um, but uh, in line with that, there are lots of various myths around uh, translingual English. It's also, um, th those myths are increasing. So uh, there are lots of myths about translingual English, people and scholars, policymakers, practitioners and academics, they're starting to question of, you know, what is really translingual English? So together with that, we have lots of myths about translingual English. So I'm going to um, now revisit some of the main, actually three main myths around translingual English, and then uh, we'll um, explore more about translingual English with the myth. Okay, so the first myth is, According to my um, uh, according to my observation or according to my understanding, translingual English may often be uh, considered as something gibberish. So, what do I mean by gibberish? So, translingual English can be sort of labeled as a sort of superficial language or or trivial language, and people think that translingual English doesn't deserve to be taken seriously, especially in terms of policy making, educational practice, especially in terms of academic context and institutional context. So for example, some of the scholars in Mongolia, they don't take translingual English seriously because they think it's some kind of gibberish that young people are using to communicate with each other. And then language is so substandard and language is so trivial. So why do we bother to even study about translingual English? Because it's gibberish and we, we, need, to and we need to speak proper English, right? So that's one of the main myths of the translingual English. Um, um, oh, here, uh, so some of the examples here, for example, um, especially in the Mongolian context, uh, some of the, uh, you know, uh, very popular public speakers, they refer to translingual English, not only translingual English, but also uh, translingual Japanese or French or Korean. They are really increasing. We don't have a proper multilingual linguals. We have just uh, gibberish multilinguals who, who don't speak anything properly. So it's quite gibberish, it's quite trivial. So this kind of uh, trend is very common, not only in Mongolia, but also beyond Mongolia and around the world. So I would like to draw your attention to some of the facts about uh, now, why translingual English also, you know, if you look at the other side of the coin, we don't necessarily have to understand translingual English as gibberish because they are actually creating something really new in the society and we can't really ignore that. So let's have a look here in this example here. So 
here is the photo of um, uh, former United States of America, President Barack Obama. So here you can see Barack Obama, he's standing there at the United Nations General Assembly and he's, uh, you know, trying to wave, uh, wave it, uh, you know, the, the audience. And then uh, he accidentally um, blocks the face of the former uh, Mongolian president, Elbik Dorch uh, Tehya. So during this photo op with the leaders, um, the photograph was about to be snapped, but then Obama suddenly raised his hand to wave. And then Obama is captured smiling and with his waving hand and completely covering the face of the president of Mongolia, who was standing right next to him. So these photographs created a, a very big store, especially among the general population of Mongolia, with many people making jokes and mocking the photo. And the, as a result of this photo, we have um, Obama's name, for example, have been absolutely entirely, uh, entirely has become, uh, you know, it has created a completely new meaning in the society. Um, so here's, here's the photo, Obama flaps photo operate up by blocking the world lead, leader's face with faith. So it has also created a stir um, uh, also around the world as well. So here's the expression that we call Obama. So as you can see, here is um, the name of Obama, and then here is the Mongolian suffix dah. So dah me means sort of shall we, let's, uh, you know, if you translate it into English. So the combination of English, um, well, Obama is sort of a name of the former American US president, but um, so we call it kind of superficially here English, right? because it's not necessarily an English name either. So, so when you uh, mix Obama with the Mongolian suffix da, it becomes the, it creates the new meaning, Obama. So now Obama da is a sort of, um, Obama da, so I'll just move on to the next one here. So now uh, the Mongolian term Obama, Obama is, is a very, very popular term in Mongolia. Everybody uses this term. Everybody knows this term. And when people are trying to be in the photo and trying to block each other's face, we are now every Mongolian call it Obama, you know? So it becomes beyond the context of the uh, president's name. Now, every person in Mongolia, especially in social media, they know what is Obama. So here say, Obama it means it, it means that, you know, this uh, champion of Mongolian wrestling, he is also Obama, uh, Obama, Obama, he's doing the Obama to each other. Um, Here's another one, the mining workers, they block each other's face with the shawl and then they say, you know, we're, this is the art of the Obama. So this is very, very common in Mongolian society. And here is another example here. Um, so uh, we're talking about translingual English creating new languages. So this is not only common in the Mongolian context, but it's also common in around the world. For example, here in Chinese context, Li Wei, he has shown in his study um, about uh, translingual English being embedded within translingual practice. And he has shown how many new languages, new forms of expressions are created in China as well. As you can see here, Chen Siumar, a mesh of Chinese consumer, usually referring to Chinese tourists buying large quantities of luxury goods and of overseas citizens as well, reflecting how ordinary citizens in China feel about their status in society and so forth. So, so uh, the myth number one, uh, translingual English being gibberish is a bit critical here because we can see that, you know, how it's actually 
adding lots of new meanings and new, lots of new vocabularies and words and expressions to the local language, um, to the local language vocabulary as well. And as Tom Reynolds say, even pe people, you know, they utter gibberish. It's completely sort of, you know, surprised me how they never fail. Um, you know, they, they completely make sense to each other and it's quite, um, you know, um, inspiring or quite... Uh, Fascinating. Now, the second myth is um, translingual English is a threat. So, um, not so. I I do this. I argue this because, especially when you look at Mongolian society, there are lots of people who think that English. You know, they support that English should be taught, English should be spoken in Mongolia because it's very important international language. But when we want to learn English, it should not be mixed with anything. It should not be mixed with Mongolian language. It should be it should not be mixed with Mongolian identities because if we do that, then it's a big threat to the Mongolian language and society and identity and culture. So um, this is uh, uh, not necessarily similar to Robert Phillips's uh, linguistic imperialism. Uh, um, but yes, it, it's in line with that argument where they argue that um, you know language should be kept uh, pure, uh, language should be kept purely because. You know, it can threaten uh, local language and society. So, um, so here are some of the examples I've, I, uh, I'm presenting here. Uh, especially it's very popular in Mongolia. You know, Mongolian uh, famous writers and academics, they argue that Mongolian language is becoming a violated language because it's getting mixed with English, you know, and it's creating something absolutely new, which have, we haven't experienced before. But remember, Mongo Mongolian language has also been greatly influenced by Russian language as well before, before Mongolia was a, you know, Soviet country. And here another famous uh, professor is saying that Mongolian language is being infested with head lies, and he refers to English, you know. And then all this... Uh, Translingual English users, they are often, uh, you know, uh, they're often sort of uh, labeled as weird, arrogant, you know, monkey like identities, and so forth. So, this is also one of the myths of the translingual um, English. So, but I would like to present another fact in terms of uh, this myth. So if we think that translingual English is really threatening the Mongolian language and culture or, or that particular society language and identity, we will also have to look at the new identities that are, uh, new identities that are being performed and created in the society. So let's So let's have a look at here. Uh, uh, Mongolian very famous um, rock music band, The Who. So The Who is a Mongolian folk rock band which was formed in 2016. And uh, two of the videos, uh, they have been released in late 2018 and they had together gardened almost half a billion viewers on YouTube. And the uh, first single called Wolf Totem reached number one on Billboard's Hard Rock Digital Song Sales. And also the second song reached number seven on the same chart. And basically uh, The Who is becoming very, very popular and famous around the world. And they have started touring in Australia, North America, Europe and Asia. And they, ha have, become a, uh, they have become a truly global uh, sensation. So why is, uh, wh what is who and how do we understand who here? So when they um, play their music, when they produce their music, who they predominantly, they use English, but they don't use just English, they use translingual English. They use the beats and parts of English they use beats and parts of English in their lyrics, in their posters, in their 
um, CD albums uh, as decorations or ornaments, or they even use a little bit of English expressions here, there, here and there in their lyrics and so forth. So English plays, uh, translingual English plays quite a uh, uh, main role in terms of uh, who's um, uh, creating this identity of the who. But um, also, who is also very popular for using um, the traditional Mongolian um, instruments such as horse-headed fiddle, tofshur, or Mongolian throat singing. And they also, in their lyrics, they often use, um, oh, sorry. In their lyrics, they often use this Mongolian ancient war cries that were used during the Mongol, uh, uh, Mongol Empire, Genghis Khan. And they also use um, a lot of uh, historical lyrics from a Mongol Empire. And in their music video, they use the beautiful Mongolian, Mongolian landscape, uh, Mongolian history, Mongolian horses, and so forth. But uh, all of these uh, Mongolian related um, cultural and linguistic resources are also mixed with the Western heavy metal record rock, such as Metallica, Rammstein, System of a Down. So, and also they use a lot of uh, aspects and styles from Mongolian shamanism, which was the main religion during the Mongol Empire and Genghis Khan time. But in the lyrics, they also criticize the current Mongolian politicians for being corrupted, you know, and the Mongolia is still being a um, underdeveloped country despite, uh, despite its very rich mineral resources and so, uh, and so forth. But then who, uh, you know, they all mix all of these available uh, resources. As you can see here, the English is being, Roman script is being used here. And then here they use lots of motorbikes, uh, uh, bikes uh, representing the Mongolian horsemen. And then here using um, uh, throat singing and another sort of, you know, use of just English. And then the name who is also the combination of uh, the who, but then they also, who means uh, the combination of human, English human and Mongolian hung. Hung is in Mongolian means human, person, and in English it's human. So the combination of English and Mongolian, the who means we are humans. But then also the who is also sort of um, inspired by the ancient Mongolian tribe called the Hunu tribe. So all of these combinations uh, starting from translingual English and going beyond translingual English, um, uh, they are creating something new, a new identity, which has never been heard before. And it's called Hunu rock. And now Hunu rock is really rocking the world. Okay, so. And then who knew uh, rock or the who uh, uh, band, they have been um, awarded the state top prize called uh, Genghis Khan Prize. Um, so the Mongolian president, uh, Batola, they congratulated the band for their accomplishments in uh, promoting the country. And not many uh, sort of popular music artists have been rewarded this top end uh, prize in Mongolia, only elite academics or elite classical music performers have been awarded before, but now finally uh, young Mongolian popular music artists have been awarded this high ranking prize from the president. Oh, this is some of the interview extracts. So I will revisit this interview ex extracts later about who. Now I will revisit the myth number three, which is um, translingual English is often uh, labeled as English. Uh, so when we talk about the translingual English, it's always about, um, you know, English. It's, all, it's always centered around English. So, for example, when we talk about English in China or English in Japan, English in Korea, we still call it English, as you can see, Chinglish, Japlish, Konglish, or Mongo Monglish, you know? So when we talk about translingual English, we always uh, label them as English. 
So, but if we look at the fact number three, especially the recent uh, arguments in a critical trans perspective, perspectives, where uh, languages, um, language or English should be understood from the understanding of uh, relocalization. So we have lots of uh, terms such as re-intextualizations, re, re recontextualization, recycling, reappropriation. So the main ethos of these terms are um, people may borrow or repeat or mimic certain linguistic resources. For example, people can borrow from English, but then when they borrow this language or English resources, um, in the local context, they always try, they always make, you know, new senses, they always make new um, meanings. Um, so it's about So it's about, um, as Penny Cook has argued, it's about fertile mimesis, it's about renewal and revitalization, it's about language being renewed, it's about language taking its new local meanings when they are mixed with the local ideas, local linguistic resources and local cultures. So this is one of the uh, fact number three where English, for example, here I use uh, Shaila's, uh, Shaila, Dr. Shaila Sultana's uh, paper here, she says in the Bangladeshi context, for example, if you see here um, how English words are weaved into the Bangla language through their adaptation to Bangla morphology. So English resources are basically what she's arguing here is being deeply relocalized into the Bangla morphology and syntax and semantics. And then when they are deeply relocalized into the Bangla morphology, English might lose its own meaning already. And when English speakers, you know, they try to, when they look at these examples, they might, might not be able to understand this anymore. So why do we still calling it actually translingual English as English? So that is the myth and that is the question we have. Here in Mongolian context as well, you can see here the word emorla. So emorla is the combination of the word emo English emotion and Mongolian suffix law. So emora means that, you know, one is getting very much upset and emotional, but this word has never been, has never existed before. But now that English emo emotion has been relocalized into the Mongolian context with the Mongolian syntax and morphology, now it makes a completely new meaning, which is called um, emotion, you know, being emotional or upset. In Mongolian lang language, it's called emorla. So this is a sort of a deeply re relocalized version of translingual English. And it's very hard actually to label it as English. There is another social media related uh, English, uh, translingual English words, which are deeply relocalized into the Mongolian language. For example, here you can see postender mention gifotten. It means, please mention me in your post, right? But it has, totally been relocalized into the Mongolian syntax. And I don't think English language speakers would be able to understand it as English. And every Mongolian person now understands what does post in the mention he called, for example, you know, it means mention in your post. Uh, also here, live he means to do live on Facebook. And it's also deeply sort of relocalized into the Mongolian context. So, um, so I've just um, sort of revisited three myths about English, uh, translingual English uh, through, through my uh, talk. And, uh, but then I try to deconstruct and unpack some of this myth around translingual English. So the extent of translingual English use and its cause and effects in contemporary globalized world is very visible and active. But I argue that it's very much connected to everything else. You know, young people are um, here or translingual English users are here seen as very active and pow powerful language users because they are powerfully and actively engaged with all these uh, productions, 
linguistic productions and communicative productions, and they are all relocalizing their available linguistic resources. And when we talk about translingual English, we also need to understand translingual in English uh, in terms of everything else, as Leonardo da Vinci said, in terms of, uh, for example, when we revisit uh, the example of the who. So when we talk about translingual English, we will have to understand it in everything else uh, because human beings are all, uh, nature are all connected. So we will have to go on with that. So translingual English is, is connected to everything else and we need to understand that aspect. So thank you very much. And sorry, I, I, uh, I'm a bit, yeah, I'm a bit late. So thank you very much.